Thank you, Kelly. I'm delighted to be speaking in this session today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ayanna Vidal and I am Head of Policy and Government Affairs at Innovate Finance. Innovate Finance is the industry body for UK fintech, representing members from across the sector who innovate in financial services. Um, I'm delighted to be speaking today on something that we have been working very hard to support, um, the fintech review um, and thinking about fintech dreaming big. Uh, so the fintech review was commissioned by the Chancellor in his March budget and was launched formally by the Economic Secretary John Glenn in July. Uh, the review is comes at an incredible point for fintech. Uh, we've seen a decade of innovation and uh, you know businesses, startups that started in Silicon Roundabout, for example, or Level Thirty Nine, that are now uh, you know national and global in their in their in their scope. Uh, the fintech review has been commissioned by the government to look at what more we can do. Uh, to promote the success of the sector and to really think about how we capitalise and leverage on the technology and the skills and expertise that we have in the country. So the review is being chaired um, by Ron Khalifa, who's the former vice chairman of WorldPay and being supported by Innovate Finance and the City of London Corporation. It is looking at five key work streams and thinking about the, the growth of the sector through these five prisms. So the first one is skills and talent. Uh, the UK fintech sector is obviously a really thriving place to start a business and also to build a career. Um, but it's really good to think about what other skills we need um, and how the growth of the sector will influence the people that we bring in to work um, in the UK and also the people that we skill up. Um, so the review is looking at not only our our immigration system, our visa system, how we remain open and how we are able to attract to attract the brightest and the best to the UK, um, but also looking at our homegrown talent, um, our, our young people, especially during this time, and thinking about how we can work well with schools, with colleges and with universities um, to build up the right skills within our workforce so that we really have a thriving sector and people who are excited to work in fintech for, for many years to come. The second theme is around capital investment, and I think it's well known that the UK is a great place to start a business. We have a thriving startup community and there are a number of grants, uh, programmes, accelerators that can help people to scale up. Where the challenge is, and it's well known, is that whilst the UK is really good and probably the best in the Europe at attracting investment, so the larger you grow, um, the bigger your business, the harder it is to attract investment within the UK or even Europe. And we find that many of our firms have to look further afield to the States or sometimes to Asia to attract that later stage capital. So what we want to do, and, and it very much ties in with the, the, the government's agenda for building out our, our tech capability and, and building out tech companies that can rival the likes of Amazon, for example, or Netflix, is how do we build that later stage capital within the UK. Can we look at our, our pension funds or our insurance companies to think about building in that patient capital into our promising companies? Um, and can we look at our, our listings market, for example, and thinking about the many companies that are, that are ripe for listing in the UK in the next few years, how can we make the UK and London attractive place to list your company? The third theme is around our national connectivity. And again, we know that this is very uh, hot on the government's agenda, um, especially thinking about levelling up across the country. Um, it, FinTech isn't just a London thing or a Southeast thing. Um, we have thriving centres of excellence and, and hubs across the UK. Um, we have not only just in terms of the businesses and where they're based um, in places like Manchester, in Cardiff, in, in Edinburgh, but also in the way that people are using services. So we have real thriving centres of excellence around sort of comparison sites or, or, or lending in other parts of the country. I think now is a really good time to think about how we can capitalise on that growth, um, how we can build that connectivity across the country, and especially during this time, how we can think about using digital capabilities um, to bring that together. So there is a real good news story here in how we can build a fintech sector across the UK that is working and collaborating well to capitalise on the prize globally. Uh, the fourth theme is around policy and regulation, one obviously close to my heart given my day job, 
and what the you know the questions to be asked around this are really again looking at that scaling journey the UK is a great place to start the fintech we have a world class regulator in, in the FCA and other regulators and we have a favorable environment for innovation and growth um, through our legislative and, and, and regulatory agenda, but not just from the UK, um, but also from Europe. Now, the challenge is to think about once you've started a business, once you've grown it, once you've become, um, once you've acquired a number of customers, if you are a, a, a B2C provider, how do you then scale and grow in a way that is sustainable? Um, in a way that protects customers, but that also allows you to innovate and to build those products and services that can benefit consumers. And we are looking and thinking about policy and regulation through that prism. Um, a lot of the regulation and legislation that we uh, that sort of governs our financial services system today was was devised and was implemented long before we knew what a Monzo was or a Starling was or you know another uh, any other fintechs in the sector. So we really need to think about how we can look through that prism as to where our companies are now and where we want them to get to and what we can do from a sort of a policy and regulatory perspective to make sure that they grow in a way um, that can benefit the country. The, the final theme is around our international attractiveness and competitiveness, and that's incredibly important um, for what I'll say next in what we do. But uh, the UK, obviously, you know, has a has a thriving global fintech brand. We call ourselves a, a global leader. Um, but we do know that uh, there are other parts of the world that do this well as well. So we really need to think about what we do well and what our unique selling point is um, and consider what we can do to help our UK companies scale overseas um, and capitalize on that UK brand um, wherever they might expand to. But equally, we want to attract innovative, exciting, thriving companies to the UK as well. We want people to look at the UK as a place in which to, to bring their customers and to bring their businesses and their employees. So also thinking about how we can attract fintechs to the UK um, to help build our thriving ecosystem. So that, that's the review and, and that's what it's looking at in its entirety. And it's an incredibly exciting time to be involved in and thinking about what fintech can do. and. Um, I think I wouldn't be uh, doing a service to this this uh, this topic if I didn't say that there are two big events that are, that feature feature quite largely in this conversation and that will have a huge impact. The first is obviously COVID and what's happened this year, not just in the UK but across the world, and how this pandemic has changed the way we work, changed the way we you know changed the way we communicate, um, and but importantly for fintech, changed the way that consumers. Um, use financial services. So it is estimated that in April, 6 million adults downloaded a, a banking app for the first time. That's 12% of the adult population in the UK. That's an incredible transformation in terms of the way that consumers are using financial services. And we know that recently the Open Banking Implementation Entity announced that there are now 2 million accounts using Open Banking in the UK. So we've seen an incredible, almost exponential growth in the uptake of digital financial services over the last few months. And there is a real opportunity now to capitalise on that and consider what will be sticking, what habits have customers picked up and learned that we can then build on and really help them to sort of to manage their money well, to use digital services to support um, whether that's you know managing debt, as we know, will be um, an incredible challenge in the months to come, but also in managing their savings and in think about planning for the future. So there's a real opportunity here that has been given to us by COVID to think about financial services differently, and as well as the sort of the you know the growth in uh, the uptake of SME you know uh, fintech lenders, for example, or the growth in wealth management apps from a B two C side. We have also seen companies accelerating their digital transformation and growth. Um, we have seen, uh, you know, the likes of Barclays uh, uh, partnering with Scalable Capital, or we've seen NatWest partnering with Kogo, or Legal and General partnering with Chumelo. Now they are using fintechs and using the power of fintech to deliver incredible services to their customers but equally they're also going through their own transformation journeys on the basis that this pandemic has shown us that we have to think differently about how we do that so there is a real opportunity here for the gap between fintech 
and financial services to be closed. And we know this is live. Um, this is a live topic for ministers and a live topic for people in the industry about how we can push that forward. From a government perspective, we've seen a lot of interest in, in fintech as well. Uh, we recently saw HMRC put out a tender looking at uh, open banking and leveraging that in their uh, in their architecture. We know that the business department base is looking at smart data and how we can help uh, consumers to own their data and be able to, to, to make it portable across different providers. And we have others like the FCA and other parts of government looking at the power of fintech, open banking, um, SME lending and other places where we know that our companies can really make a difference. So this is a really key inflection point in terms of the adoption of digital services. And I think the second uh, uh, event that we also know is really feeding into this agenda is the coming end of the Brexit transition period. So come January 1st, the UK will be out of the EU and this will pose a number of challenges and risks that I think many in the sector are very well aware of, but it also poses a number of opportunities and there is a chance for the UK and our financial services sector to think differently about what we do in the future. Um, whilst we want to maintain a good and close relationship with Europe and we want to be harmonised in terms of how we operate so that our businesses and companies are, are readily able to scale and grow in European markets, we also know that there are opportunities now for the UK to think differently and perhaps capitalise on um, the opportunity that we have uh, to, to build out our financial services system within here, but also to think about how we leverage that in the trade deals that we do um, in other parts of the world. So, as I said, we know that there is competition, hot competition from other markets, whether that be places like Singapore or Australia, Canada, uh, the States, France. We know that lots of countries are looking very closely at where the, the prize could be and thinking about their thriving fintech sectors. So now is a really good opportunity, an excellent opportunity, in fact, for, for the UK to look at its fintech sector and think about this decade of innovation, what can we do and what can we put in place to really grow for the next 10 years? So it's an incredibly exciting time. We've had a lot of growth. We've had a lot of, of opportunity and a lot of success. But we, as I said, we cannot afford to rest on our laurels. And there is much more that can be done um, to help our, our sector grow, um, not just for the sake of growth, but for the benefit of citizens and consumers in the UK and abroad. Um, I'm really excited um, to see what comes out of the review. Um, we expect it to be reporting back early in 2021. Um, and I'm excited to hear people's questions now. Um, thank you for listening. Great stuff. Many thanks for that, um, Ayana. And uh, great to, to have you here for the live Q&A. Uh, good afternoon. Hi, Adam. Lovely to be here. Good stuff. Perfect. So uh, there's a few questions that have come through. I'm going to dive straight in. We've got around six minutes. Um, so the first one, uh, when you spoke about the review helping current fintechs grow um, once they're already established, um, you know, that's really interesting. Uh, where do you foresee the main benefits of the review uh, for new startups in the UK or for more established fintech companies? So I think um, we're trying not to do, do sort of an, an and or. Um, but I think if you look at the, if you go to the Treasury's website and you look at the terms of reference for the review, I think it's very clear that the government recognises that there's been a lot of work over the last few years to make the UK a real leader in starting a business um, from a capital and investment perspective, from a sort of an infrastructure perspective. We've got a number of sort of leading accelerators and incubators that can support that growth if you are, you are coming along, you, a founder, a couple of co-founders and building. Where I think the review is trying to sort of take thinking on is right now that you've started that process, you've established your business, you're building some success, you're growing your team, um, you're, you're, you know, you're gaining customers. What does that scaling journey look like on the basis that we know that we've got some world class, you know, fintech firms here and world class regulators and support from from government and, and central bodies. But how do we bring that together to really capitalise on, on what success could be? And on the basis that we know that there are other parts of the world that do this really well. So, I mean, I definitely say we are that, you know, the review is considering all manner of issues as they relate to the fintech journey, but there's definitely an emphasis on the scaling part on the basis that that's where perhaps policy and, and, and government thinking hasn't quite um, focused on as of yet. 
Great, thanks for that. Good detailed answer to, to get started. Um, so the next question uh, focuses uh, around talent. Um, particular delegate said, I read that 42% of UK fintech employees are non-native to the UK. Um, what is the target percentage here post-Brexit? So that's a, I'm really tickled by that question because I think a target, what do we want a target for? Um, <laughs> I, I, I personally think that one of the absolute strengths of our sector is the fact that we've got 42% people working in it who are from different parts of the world. FinTech is a global business, right? And you need to have a global workforce in order to drive that and build that success. Some of our most you know, successful startups were started by people like you know, Nick Storonsky of Revolut or, or Jeff Lynn of Cedars who aren't from the UK but they've chosen here to build their businesses and build their careers. They've, they've literally bet the house on the UK. So I think that's a real strength for us as a starting point. Now, obviously with Brexit, that will have an impact on immigration. Anyone who's just listened to the Chancellor speaking in Parliament will hear from the Comprehensive Spending Review announcement that the government is still keen to attract the brightest and best to the UK. One of the things we want to explore for the sector through the review and outside of that as well is as well as attracting the brightest and best to work in our firms, how do we also grow the homegrown talent? How do we invest in our young people and help them to see a future in our thriving fintech sector? So I think the two of those very much go hand in hand. Um, and I definitely want to put, wouldn't want to put a target or a percentage on, on how many people should be working um, in the fintech sector from different backgrounds in future. Mm -hmm. No, definitely I'm in agreement. Um, let's ensure that the, the fintech market continues to, to stay fertile post-Brexit, that's for sure. Um, and then the final question, um, just in terms of the, the review, um, you know, what are the, the key elements of the review that the fintech should take on board when building their growth strategy? Um, I, I guess um, pretty um, interesting and fits in with our next session, which is uh, kind of life's a pitch. We've got three budding young fintechs fighting it out for, for the launch uh, gong for 2020. Um, so this probably leads nicely into that as a, as a final question. So I'll, I'll hand over to you there. Thank you. So I definitely wouldn't want to preempt anything that the re review might come out with. Um, but what I will say, there are a few key themes and issues that we've been discussing that I think it would be helpful to play back. Um, as we've just talked about skills and talent, I'll say with skills and talent, as I said, um, our immigration system is changing. So, our, you know, fintech firms will have to change their strategy for acquiring talent and thinking about that. And as I said, there's a short term objective around hiring from abroad and what that looks like, um, as well as seeing what's available in the current workforce. But equally, I think there's a longer term objective about how fintechs play a role in, in growing the understanding of fintech and financial innovation um, through, you know, the growing sort of body of young people that are coming up. I think two other points to make are, as I talked about, the sort of the policy and regulatory objectives that that, that meet the scaling journey. Um, and I think there's certainly things that we've learned um, through this process that um, there are policy and regulatory changes that could be made. But equally, fintechs really need to make sure they keep an eye on what they need to do from the from a growth perspective when it comes to regulation and be very conscious of that. Um, and I think the final thing I would say is that um, and, and the government sort of preempted this in some of the, the, the announcements that have already been, already been made that they are very well aware of the capital investment needs of, um, of a thriving fintech sector. And I think there will be, you know, I can't, as I said, I can't preempt anything that might may or may not come in the future, but we've already seen a listings review being announced. We know the government is very interested in thinking about how to invest late stage capital um, into sort of thriving, um, exciting tech firms. This is a real opportunity for fintech and i think that's something that firms should be thinking about as they build out their growth strategies going forward as to that that funding might not come from the states in the future it might actually come from right here in the uk which is incredibly exciting for us as a nation perfect great well um ayana stack to timing as well we've got about 15 seconds so all that's left is for me to say uh, many thanks uh, to, to yourself and innovate finance for for taking part and we, we look forward to welcoming you back to an open banking expo uh, event very soon thank you thank you very much adam